Hi folks, not sure what happened with Stuart there. I'm sure he will, it was just a technical problem. I'm sure he will join us very shortly. So if you just stay in the room, that would be great. And we'll see if Stuart comes back in a few minutes. Thank you. Once again, apologies, folks, for those that have just joined the room. We're having some technical problems with Stuart's access to the site, so we will endeavour to get him back into the room as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm back. Um, hopefully I'm all connected again. Oh, great. Um, not sure what happened there. Just had a complete um, loss of uh, internet there. Um, thanks to this session is sponsored by New Zealand Telecom, um, who, who didn't like my 
IP address for some reason for a moment. Um, no, I didn't. Um, I actually, I had turned off my camera. I had turned off my camera. Uh, anyway, Liz, just um, I don't know, maybe one one or two people just arrived recently, so um, just nice for them to see me. Uh, and I use that in the broadest sense of, of the phrase. Um, we have a very international audience. We do. We have anyone that's not asleep. I think is um, is the message here. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing because obviously it will speed things up for people. Um, try and do a nice little pose. Uh, actually, start sharing. There you go. There we go. We we could have we could have had a little wave, just like the Queen. Uh, sorry, I just I just couldn't live with that particular picture there. I'm trying to look interesting. Okay, so Moodle in business. Um, first of all, I should just introduce myself. Uh, my name's Stuart Milor. I'm the managing director of HRDNZ, and we are a Moodle partner based in New Zealand. Um, although we actually have, in, in fact, most of our work is actually uh, overseas these days. Um, obviously, New Zealand is, an, a, <laughs> it is important to us as a market. Um, but in terms of work that we do, um, more than 50% of our work is now from overseas clients or overseas projects, which is cool. Um, what I'm going to do, just while I'm doing this little bit of an introduction, is just flick into this view. Um, uh, I will, yeah, I will visit a Dutch Moodle Moot one day, definitely. Um, we've just got a little, um, a couple of polls in here where you can let me know who we've got here as an audience. Um, I guess I should have cleared those out earlier um, because this also has people from the first session. This is the second time we've we've run this particular session. Um, but I guess it still is going to give us a, a good ballpark overview of what's happening. So um, looking at the experience of people that are here, ranging from moderate to expert, um, and that's good, and that's kind of what I'd expect, you know, this isn't uh, a session for, for beginners. Um, which sector describes you best? Interestingly, sort of about a third of people in, in public education and then the majority, uh, everyone else, in all sorts of different areas, which is, which is really cool. Um, if you are an other, if you've selected other, you could maybe just post in the chat if you want to exactly what other means um, in your context. That might be interesting. And then finally, which version of Moodle are you using? Um, now that's uh, that, that that's an interesting one. That most the vast majority here are actually using Moodle 2.2, and uh, again a, a large number using 1.9, which is what we might expect. So that that's useful and it helps me. As um, as we go through this presentation, it helps me understand exactly uh, who you are, which is great. Um, so what I'm going to do in this uh, presentation is basically use uh, a, a screen share to uh, a Moodle course. Um, and the first thing to say is that the Moodle course is is it's a totally open course. It even allows guest access, so you're able to get to all this uh, information and the things that we look at after this session without any problem at all. Um, I can't quite remember where I was in my introduction, but um, we'll, we'll ignore that for the moment. Um, so let me, let me make a few little changes and go to screen sharing. And if this all works correctly, I should be able to share my Firefox window with people. Uh, share my screen, choose Firefox, click on share, and hopefully, he said, you are now seeing the, uh, you're now seeing basically what I'm seeing, the Firefox window. Um, if you can, uh, if you can, if anyone can confirm that, that that is what you're seeing and that it's a reasonable uh, sort of quality, that would be good. I'm just going to size things on my screen so I can see uh, the chat, so I can hopefully keep an eye on any comments as we're um, as we're going through. I'm just going to zip into 
one of my um, one of the courses that I use here. In fact, I might just log out as admin, which is a terrible habit. Logging into uh, to one of our sites as admin. Never, never, never do that unless you're actually doing something administration-wise. Um, so lazy these days. Just wait for that to catch up. So there's a course on this site called Moodle in Business, and, and this is uh, what I'm going to use for the majority of this session. Um, as it says here, this isn't really a course. It's more an area that, that I use to, to pull ideas together and to pull information together that I then use at, at conferences or in training. So um, it, it is here, and it is um, public for everyone to see. Um, and in this discussion forum, there is a copy of a document that I produced last year, which is, uh, or even the year before now, um, which is all about using Moodle in small to medium-sized businesses. And that kind of takes you through from the rationale for, for deciding on Moodle in the first place, and then some of the uh, important considerations uh, that, that you might want to consider, uh, or you might want to think about thoroughly. Um, and there's also just a little bit of information there about myself. Um, my, my background initially was as a, a graphic designer. Uh, in f slightly before that, I was a completely failed school student. Um, school didn't agree with me, got kicked out at 16. And I do remember meeting uh, one of my teachers years later and, and saying to him uh, in a bus stop somewhere, quite random, and I said, hi, Mr. Bramwell, you know, um, guess what I'm doing now? I'm a teacher and, and the look of horror on his face. Uh, will will haunt me forever. Um, I must have been an, an absolutely terrible student. Um, but I, I then went into graphic design. Uh, one of the few things I could do was actually draw at that age. Um, and I then sort of went through and became a bit more sensible and, and did um, a teaching degree and um, certified internet webmaster and became a Microsoft trainer um, and so on and so forth. I also did an MBA in international business. And I guess bringing those three strands together of being a graphic designer and being a teacher and being a businessman, I think that be, running a Moodle partner is actually a really nice um, place for me to be because I can c combine some of those um, some of those different skills. Ah, oh, Sally, come on, you have to do your MBA. Everyone's got one these days, apparently. Um, you can do them in six months now. Uh, mine took four years and seems quite thorough. Um, People who may know me in here um, from um, work on Moodle.org, um, I run the Moodle certification scheme, the Moodle course creator certificate, and we, we support other partners around the world doing that. Um, and I also facilitate a number of areas like the business uses and the database area on um, Moodle.org. So um, quite often see me around there. And I've just got some little links at the top there to the, to the business uses area, and there's also a Moodle users group on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and these, these places, interestingly, tend to be fairly quiet. And the reason for that is that in business, we don't tend to be as sharing of our knowledge as, as teachers, perhaps. Um, and that's, that's a theme that I guess will crop up a couple of times during this, this, this session, is that in business, we... we tend to think of intellectual property and of knowledge as being a competitive advantage and being something that we actually have to guard very jealously. Um, that's true to a large extent, um, but it's not necessarily always the case in, in every specific context. Okay. So um, having worked as I do with, with all types of, of businesses um, over the years with Moodle, um, these are the sort of themes that often come through those discussions. Um, things like actually having a, 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 a Moodle strategy, not feeling like it's something that's constantly moving and, and open source developers are changing it instantly and blah, et cetera, but having a, a strategy around Moodle and, and how we manage the site, how we do things like enrollment and payment. Uh, branding and themes are incredibly important to the the business or commercial market, 
and then people, you know, saying, well, how do we, how do we utilize SCORM or how do we track what our users are doing? So, the, so these are the things that often come through as being very important to the business commercial sector and maybe not quite so important to the average teacher in a school or university. So what I'm going to do is initially use this uh, lesson, which is just a lesson in Moodle. Um, one day I should turn this into a wiki so I can actually edit it faster and, and let other people uh, add into it. That would probably be much better. Um, so I guess one of the main questions that we're looking at here is initially, can Moodle actually be an effective solution as a, as a learning management system or as a training system within, within business, within a, a more commercial sector? Um, so the first thing we need to do is identify what that sector is. Now, I kind of split organizations up into two when thinking about this. The, the first group are the, the organizations that receive public money in some way, shape, or form whether that's from government or, or county or local local authority. But that kind of means universities, polytechnics, colleges and schools. Um, and, um, you know, I take on board that universities these days certainly don't get as much money as they used to. I can't think of, of any country in the world that's funding its universities as, as highly as it has in the past. Um, they're becoming more business orientated. But these organisations on the left generally... Are, are not primarily uh, invoicing clients, if you like, in that way. Um, the second group, people who, who are definitely in a, a commercial space, um, private training enterprises, corporates, businesses, um, independent trainers who are, who are using Moodle to, to run a business, obviously things like public sector, a lot of Moodle adoption in the, in the health sector, for example, over the past few years. And also not-for-profits and charities who, um, and, you know, sometimes that's a, a, a cloaking system, not-for-profit or charity. You know, some of these organizations make a hell of a lot of money. Um, but certainly in terms of um, the way their accounting works, they're, they're not uh, making money. Um, now, the interesting thing is that if we look at the way that first group measured the benefit of Moodle, um, it tends to be tied to the... Uh, educational outcomes or educational benefits of, of learners. And we might look at things like how many students are logging in, uh, how many courses do we have, what are the exam results like, uh, who's using it from home. So we might look at how successful our learning management system is in, in the context of what are people doing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Interestingly, when we look at how we measure success for that second group, um, it's quite different usually. We might be looking at things at how much did it cost exactly because we want to know how much it saved us. Has it made us more economically efficient? Um, did it generate n new forms of income? Um, what are our competitors doing? And that's a really interesting point for small businesses um, in the commercial and, and commercial is that you're always having to look at what new products, what new techniques are out there uh, with, with, with other people in a similar sector. So looking at, are, are all our competitors actually using e-learning now in some way? Um, you know, does it create an advantage or, or benefit for us in a, in a real, real strong way? And the decision factors to um, how you then say, yes, we're going to adopt Moodle, we're going we're gonna to really go full out and use this properly, um, those decision factors are different as well. Um, in the first group, you know, your schools and universities say, well, Moodle costs nothing. It's great. A lot cheaper than, than Blackboard or whatever. Um, we've probably got the IT infrastructure. We will have a, com uh, a computer network within our organization and probably find a server that we can put Moodle on somewhere. We're going to have some IT staff that can help. Um, education's our core business, you know, so um, it seems kind of logical to have a learning management system. And... Um, Technology is, is an accepted part of our environment now. Um, it doesn't surprise us when a, when a kid goes into school with an iPad or wants to use their iPhone to, um, to access their course. So that's the picture that we, that we might take into consideration within a, a school or university, a polytechnic. 
However, in a business or commercial setting, these decision factors can be completely different. Uh, the common one, of course, is that Moodle costs nothing. That's always going to get a big tick from the accountant. Um, the cost of a server might be a consideration. Uh, these organizations won't necessarily have any, uh, any great IT infrastructure. So um, hosting or, or looking for exter external hosting options are a consideration. Um, there's, there's often some extra workload directly involved there. We might have one person who looks after IT. Um, in, in smaller businesses, we might even outsource IT. We might have a guy who turns up in a van once a month or, or a help desk email that, that hopefully people respond to quite quickly. So um, we might have to find an e-learning specialist to support us. Um, these last two points are really interesting because training might not be our core business. It's often seen as an unwanted expense. And, um, you know, in this context, we might be looking at the learning management system to deliver our induction training. We might be using it to look at our health and safety requirements. If, we, if we're in the finance sector, we might have financial compliance training that we have to deliver. And that's, the, that's a key point, that we have to deliver it. It's not like we're all um, singing and happy and thinking, wouldn't a learning management system be wonderful? It may be that it's an economic driver there, because at the moment, maybe all our staff are having to take one day off each quarter of a year or every half year to go to a training session. Uh, maybe we've got a variety of small offices around the country, um, we have the expense of, of giving people a day off and paying their transport, maybe even paying accommodation for some of them. Um, that's interesting because, of course, it, it, in this context, technology and training are not automatically linked. And you might get and you can get resistance from people who actually don't want to, um, don't want to learn things online. They actually like that one day off or two days off a year. They like having, uh, you know, going away to a different place and having training. They like meeting up with colleagues from different centres. They like the free lunch and having a beer at night. Um, so um, I, I can think of a really good example of an engineering company that we work with, um, and the guys there just do not want to lose what they see as a, as a really nice perk within their job, which is their sort of training sessions, um, telling them they're going to do it online is uh, actually quite a hard sell. Now, over the um, past few years, obviously we have seen the growth of users on, on Moodle.org increase. Um, and this is a pretty good indication uh, of, of the growth. Maybe we're just seeing a flattening out of that curve uh, in, in the last year. Um, I, I certainly are often uh, cognizant of the fact that I actually joined back here in, in 2005. I think my user ID was something like 12,000. And um, sometimes, you know, we see people here who are really just discovering Moodle for the first time and posting those first questions that seem so simple to some of us now. Um, and it's really important that, of course, we, we uh, remember that we were posting probably very similar questions just further back in time. And we had people around to help us. And, um, you know, important to, 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 to bear that in mind, I think. Now, the, the growth of installations, so Moodle sites around the world, uh, it kind of broadly follows that curve. And I, I guess that's not a surprise. Uh, it would be logical that if the number of registered users on Moodle.org goes up, then the number of sites is probably going up. And again, we see a little bit of a flattening um, during 2011. And I think that's probably because a lot of people have been holding off and, and um, staying with Moodle 1.9 installations and not setting up new sites in Moodle 2. Maybe that's just starting to take off now. I think that's the reason for that little dip there, maybe. Uh, now, you can access those statistics anytime on Moodle.org. I've put some links in there for you. Um, where we get more interesting is when we start to look a little bit further on and um, start looking at, for example, the version of Moodle that's being used now. Um, if you're reading the forums on Moodle.org recently, you would be forgiven for thinking that pretty much everyone is using Moodle too. And um, in fact, in the last two months, 
the majority of new Moodle installations are actually 1.9, which I think is really interesting considering Moodle 2 has been out for a long time. And I'm not quite sure why that figure is so high. If we look at all Moodle registrations by version, we can see that, you know, um, what's that, two thirds, two thirds of the world are still on Moodle 1.9. Um, as Moodle partners and as people in the forums, you know, we're talking about Moodle 2.3 and, and 2.2 and, and even 2.0. Most people nowhere near that yet. And I guess a lot, you know, a large part of this group might be old sites that aren't active anymore. But there will be a huge chunk of people here who are considering how do we move to Moodle 2 and uh, planning their migration for, for this year or next year. And when you consider that technically Moodle 1.9 is no longer a supported version from the middle of this year, uh, although it will get security updates until the end of the year, that, that's quite an interesting He's back, indeed, indeed he is back, He's trying desperately to stay here. Um, that's interesting because um, I actually got, I actually had to log into the iMoot site again, so it looked like for some reason it disconnected me from the iMoot site. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a half hour login has kicked in. Um, anyway, we should be able to do the rest within roughly half an hour, so hopefully that won't happen again. Let, let, let's see. Um, uh, if everyone can just see and hear still, that's cool. Um, I'll just carry on as if as if you can, unless I read anything different in the chat there. Um, so yeah, um, now when we go on to look at Moodle site sizes, this is where I think it starts to get really quite interesting. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm reading the forums on Moodle.org, I, I kind of get the impression that most people are working at large schools or universities, and, and most of the sites out there are, are big. What we can see from this graph is that, in fact, there are very, very few organizations, very few Moodle sites of more than 1,000 users. And the vast majority, the vast majority of Moodle sites out there in the world are under 500 users. And that suggests to me, to some extent, that we're, if we're putting a lot of effort into things like huge database optimizations and multiple enrollment systems from, from external network servers, and we might actually be taking our eye off the ball a little bit, that there's a lot of users in this area that probably need some functionality, such as much better payment systems, 
because they're possibly in more of a commercial sector or much much better reporting because they are perhaps dealing with uh, competency based training uh, and, and, and that sort of thing so it, it's it's interesting to see that difference and when I actually calculated that out and just did a very bit of very simple maths um, we actually see that more than well over 90 percent of Moodle sites have fewer than a thousand users so I think it, you know it's, it's fantastic that the Open University and, and British Columbia and etc etc are all using Moodle but they are not necessarily the biggest and certainly not the only group of users that we need to think Hi guys, I'm I'm so sorry. I am actually back, and I'm actually just trying something different. I'm actually um, I'm actually using the um, Safari and having that trigger the Adobe Connect session. But what I've done now is actually well um, logged in uh, using Firefox to see if it's actually something to do with the um, with the um, plugin for Safari that's not not working properly. Um, so, of course, okay. So, um, I think everyone can hear me, and I think everyone can um, can still see the screen share. Can anyone just confirm that quickly? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Listen, guys, if this does just turn into a, a complete disaster for some reason, um, um, then there is a recording of the first session, um, which is possible. Let me just um, share Safari. Uh, share uh, Safari with you. Okay, uh, hopefully you should be seeing Safari now, which I've managed to just quickly get to the same page that we were looking at before in Firefox. Um, 
to see if I can bring my window back so I can see the chat as well at the same time. I have a blue square. Good now. Okay. Good now. That's, um, hopefully we will be okay. So I'm just going to continue um, back to where we were. Uh, and we just basically said that 90% of our of our uh, Moodle users and Moodle sites are actually small installations or smaller than we might at first think. It's interesting as well when we look at the types of user. And again, this is a this is a little choice activity that's actually hidden away a little bit on Moodle.org. Um, here we can see that, unsurprisingly, a large number of, of university uh, people that work in universities are registering here and schools. But even so, even when we add those together, when we then look at independent teachers and companies and others, we're still coming out with a figure of, you know, 40% plus of people that are not working in universities and schools. Um, and I totally accept that universities and schools are the main people we should be developing Moodle for, the main group. Um, but I also think that businesses and, and corporates and commercials and charities, they all want to use Moodle as well and they do have sometimes slightly different requirements and they don't always get fed through on Moodle.org quite as, quite as clearly. And I guess the, the other group of users you know, will be training departments, government departments. Um, I've noticed uh, recently quite a lot of libraries actually starting to use uh, Moodle for one reason or another. And um, as we know, charities, uh, not-for-profits, and so on. So um, we tend to we tend to make a very harsh value judgment as well in business um, because if we're going to spend some money on Moodle, then that money usually has to come very clearly from somewhere else. If we're going to invest time in uh, hosting or, or well, invest money in hosting or invest time in staff training, invest time in developing courses, then we want to see a benefit, and we usually want to see a benefit very quickly. Um, that's just something that the managing director and the accountants and, and so on want to see. They'll want to see how this pays back, how it works, what, what benefits it brings. Um, I just want to flick through a couple of examples of organizations and, and I've just chosen all these because they're all small businesses that I have uh, some knowledge of within New Zealand so so I, I can sort of talk about them off the top of my head really. Um, the first one is this training.net.nz and this is a very small company um, and the, the guy behind this um, is basically uh, a tourism expert and passionate about tourism in New Zealand. Um, and he was a work-based assessor, so he would travel to uh, various places around the country uh, and assess students or learners who were going through certificates and diplomas in, in travel and tourism. And what he realized with Moodle is that a lot of the assessment he was doing could actually be placed in Moodle, and a lot of the preparation he could he could put into Moodle. There might still be a need to go and actually physically watch someone interacting with customers, but um, a lot of the stuff actually could be delivered and assessed online. Uh, but what he was, the way I think he's been quite clever is that he's then taken the uh, New Zealand Qualification Authority unit standards, which are uh, competency-based units, very similar to um, uh, MVQ in the UK and, and other competency systems. And he's taken those units and he's built courses and he's then been able to go to uh, the glowworm caves in Waitomo, um, ACE, car rentals, stray travel, um, etc. And he's been able to say to them, look, you know, I can, um, I can support your students uh, in terms of their learning and they can ask questions and they can get all their resources and I can carry out a lot of their assessment remotely. And, um, you know, he built one product, but what he had were a number of clients that he could then sell that product to. And I think that's a really nice, smart way of, of taking a very small idea and building it into something that was an effective uh, business model. Uh, another example is, uh, again, a very small company, I think two people, uh, Fact Training Solutions. 
these guys support the um, the program management professional curriculum, which is um, the kind of a a standard of project management in the world. And um, I've se I saw some of the books that they were sending out to prepare people, and these things look like telephone directories, huge books all about project management. And then they also had a second book, which was kind of half of a telephone directory. And in there was nothing but questions, nothing but page after page after page of questions. And then um, people would fill those in and send them back to be marked. So by, by taking those huge quizzes and putting them into Moodle, um, they were able to instantly uh, cut down on all the costs of, of postage and packing. Uh, obviously, there would be delays in printing new versions, which then don't need to, to be there. And of course, the actual feedback and speed of um, assessment was, was so much easier. Um, and uh, yeah, and of course, having a little website with all these questions um, actually uncovered a few new markets for for the organization as well. Um, I'll mention this one. This is um, a private training enterprise in New Zealand, a very typical, I might say, a very typical private training enterprise. Um, two campuses, one in Auckland and one in Christchurch, um, delivering a range of, of certificates and diplomas. This organization have actually adopted Moodle effectively is their whole intranet solution. So not only do they have their courses and assessments for students, but they also use this site as uh, where they put their, their meeting notes and their agendas and they, they use it as a repository for organizational learning. Um, and as a small organization, that, that can be quite a, a smart thing to do because with a little bit of work, Moodle can, can work quite nicely as an intranet for a small, small organization. Uh, I'll just pick two more. I, I picked this one, the, the College of Appearance Medicine. Um, over the past couple of years, I've dealt with the, the New Zealand College of Appearance Medicine and the New Zealand College of Massage. Um, and I can't think of a more hands-on uh, course than massage. Uh, but of course, even in those examples, there's a huge uh, amount of, of preparation, assessment, and support that can be provided through a through a, a small Moodle site. Um, it, yes, you know there, there obviously has to be some uh, hands-on. I can't avoid using that phrase there. There has to be some hands-on assessment and hands-on work. Um, but even in those very practical areas, clearly Moodle has a has an application within these small businesses. And the last one, just a quick mention. Um, this is the. Search and Rescue Institute of New Zealand, and they um, decided to use Moodle to provide a simple uh, provision for, for their students. Um, now, Sarans are actually based in Christchurch, and um, their office was completely destroyed during the Christchurch earthquake. Um, and that was interesting for two reasons. Um, first of all, we actually gave them Moodle hosting for, for, for the next year free, because we just wanted to as everyone did, you know, help people in Christchurch. Um, but more interestingly, they found a huge, uh, a huge growth in interest for search and rescue courses, because of course, so many people in the Christchurch area were involved in uh, pulling people out of buildings or searching for people, um, that it actually raised um, the profile of effective search and rescue training. Um, and you know that you know out of out of something that's obviously very sad and, and um, extremely unfortunate, um, at least a small business like this is able to then provide some some uh, some direction to people that are interested in in learning more about those things that, that we hope we never need. Um, there are some. I uh, don't need to do that one. Um, of course, in a small business, like uh, unlike a university, but potentially like a school, we do have options in how we think of our Moodle installation. Do we actually uh, outsource that? Do we do we um, look at hosting from Moodle partners or from free sites or from budget sites? Um, how what what are the pros and cons of each of those scenarios? Um, if we're a slightly bigger organisation. 
we may actually um, run the server ourselves, and then at that point, um, a smart thing to do is to bring in specialists to work with you. So you kind of go, well, we've got our Moodle server, we've got it set up, or we want you to set it up, but we actually want to manage that, and, and we'll insource your skills, and um, just use your skills when we need them, rather than paying for a big hosting contract and support contract that we may never actually utilize. So you have some decisions to make um, in terms of how you host sites. One of the key things, though, that I would like to, to say is that when it comes to support, I think that Moodle is, is the best supported learning management system out there um, by a long, long way. And I've, I've had clients and I've had a background with, with First Class and with Blackboard and with various others. Um, the amount of support you can get from Moodle.org, which is free, is, is staggering. Um, I mean, Moodle documents are getting better and better all the time. Uh, there was obviously a very rapid pace of change, and I think Docs got slightly um, out of date to some extent and a bit confused, and it wasn't always quite so easy to find what you wanted. Um, but I mean, the, the number of times I, I've seen, you know, sometimes very simple questions, sometimes incredibly complex questions or sophisticated questions posted in Moodle.org and, and the amazingness of some of those answers, uh, you know, people that absolutely know their stuff backwards and willing to share that is, uh, is phenomenal. Um, if you do get into a situation or, or you would prefer to have a paid support, then obviously you can also do that. Um, you still have that option available. So you can have the best of, uh, of both worlds, in effect. Okay. What I'm going to do now is just look a little bit through this course. As I've said, this is a, uh, a course. It's a free course. It's an area you can get to. I should just be able to type that URL and copy it to there, I think. No, it's not going to let me copy across to there. No, no problem. Um, there is a link to this within the course area. For, for the Moodle in Business on, on the iMoot site. Um, but basically, I just wanted to um, provide some guidance so that you can actually go off and use this area on your own anytime. You don't even have to register on this site if you don't want to. You can just use guest access for this uh, if you wish. Um, there are some SCORM improvements in Moodle 2 that have come along. And um, quite a lot of organizations I know in business do use SCORM uh, packages. Um, I've seen nursing courses that have uh, purchased uh, some absolutely outstanding material that's already been produced in another country and just drop that into their course. Now, obviously, you then may need to build some information around that to say, well, this legislation doesn't apply in, in New Zealand, for example. But the ability to, to purchase or, or, or share SCORM objects and drop them into courses is, is phenomenal. Um, if you don't know what SCORM is and you're unsure about that, um, there are some links here which will help you understand that. And um, if you if you have um, you know some content heavy courses that you're thinking about, it's always worth a scan to see if someone else has uh, produced this material and is willing to share it or or willing to um, to, um, to to help you with it. Yeah, I mean there are SCORM creation packages. Um, EXE is a system out of New Zealand, which is free and open source. Uh, MayaDutu is a nice online system. Um, lots of, lo lots of uh, different options for learning how to produce SCORM content. Um, you're probably best picking one or two and learning those uh, well. Yeah, Baz, obviously SCORM has been around for a long time. Um, initially, it was quite good. Maybe, you know, 2001 was quite reasonable. SCORM 2004 is an absolute nightmare for everyone. And um, yes, it should have, it should have uh, been a lot better than it, than it was. And, you know, you've got to really look at ADL and, and blame them for most of this. Um, <laughs> he said in a sweeping statement, um, Course completion, I think, is an important area for uh, business users. Sometimes, um, sometimes we don't want, you know, in school courses and university courses, we, we, we want everything to be a bit organic, and we want people to be able to maybe float around and choose to read the resource and, and uh, perhaps meander through some, through some PowerPoints or whatever. 
sometimes in a in a commercial or, or business setting, we want people to go through training, which means we want uh, we want to ensure that they read uh, this resource first, and they then do this choice, and they then take this quiz, and they then access these assignments. Um, so we want a very structured organisation. Um, so there's two things that we can do there, and, and the first is enabling course completion, which just gets switched on in your course settings, and this is Moodle 2, uh, and so on, uh, and later. Um, and what the course completion will do, I'll just flick back to here, is that it will allow me to um, read this document and actually say, okay, I've, I've read that, I'm happy with that, I'm going to tick it. So as a student, I can I can keep an eye much more sort of carefully on what I've read and what I haven't. Um, some of these items may be grey, or some may use a red tick, and that's because Moodle can be set up, the activity can be set up to say, I will automatically give you a tick when you've achieved, you know, 80% in this quiz, or when you've gone through this lesson and answered the questions. So the course completion is, is a very nice visual indicator for students um, where they are. And of course, the teacher also has the ability to view the course completion. So in this course, we have a couple of students. And here we, we can see Sylvester has actually completed this activity. And if he completed the feedback and the quiz, in that case, the course completion itself would be automatically ticked. Um, but this isn't the grade book. Don't confuse this with the grade book. This is just a way of monitoring what we may or may not have completed. Uh, the grade book is, is different. Um, but tied into course completion, of course, is conditional activities. And conditional activities, slightly different, but here's an example that I have a quiz in this course and I can't actually take that quiz yet. It says it's restricted until I've done another activity. And in this case, it's visiting Moodle.org. So this quiz does not become available until I've actually clicked on this link. So in, in this way, it's possible to um, scaffold a number of activities and resources into a very uh, linear and controlled and ordered training system. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I'd hate to think that every course in the world is going to um, be that structured and that controlled. But certainly, if we're if we're delivering health and safety training, as a good example, we want to make sure people have gone through these things, understood them, uh, we've checked their understanding. They then move on to the next section. You know, there are some areas where we want uh, a, a controlled environment and, and completion and, and um, conditional activities can, can both help with that. Um, reporting is an interesting area. Um, quite often Moodle gets, um, I guess, a bit of a bad reputation because people say that it can't report effectively on, on what's happening. Um, now, part of that is because the reporting is is kind of course and user centric, e.g. we tend to report on users and we tend to report on courses. Now there are reports that are available in Moodle out of the box and that teachers can view and activity reports and grade reports and so on. But there are also, um, I'm talking about 1.9 here, um, because 1.9 was around for such a long time, there are lots of custom reports that can be dropped into Moodle. Now, these have to be added by an administrator, of course, but they can then be uh, enabled for, for administrators or, or teachers or managers to review. And we can, we can do all sorts of things with these plug-in reports. We can look at the course sizes. We can access a private log of messages. We can, um, where is that one? We can do a full report for a user across a site. Lots of things that we can add in there. Um, yeah, Shane, that's a good point, that we can't possibly know every single reporting requirement. And if we built that into Moodle, we'd have a, a reporting system of a thousand million reports, wouldn't we, for every single different different use. Um, 
when we move to Moodle 2, I think we get into some much more interesting uh, potential here. Uh, and there's two things that I want to draw people's attention to. Um, the first is the ad hoc database queries, which is developed by Tim Hunt uh, from the Open University, who uh, a lot of people will know is the uh, maintainer of the quizzes and um, just an absolute um, genius when it comes to these things. Um, I'm not going to bring up the screenshot, but basically, um, this is a system that allows you to write reports directly into Moodle. Now, it does require that you know SQL. So if you know how to write an SQL query and you're willing to have a look at how the Moodle tables are put together, then it's pretty easy to write SQL type select queries that will, that will allow you to interrogate the database and, and bring out information that isn't necessarily there within the standard reports. So that's really, really cool. Um, by far the, the, the most amazing thing and, and probably my favorite plugin for Moodle, I noticed there was a, a, a forum which I haven't had a chance to get to about which is your favorite plugin for Moodle. Um, by far and away, my favorite plugin for Moodle um, from a business and management perspective is configurable reports. Now, this has been developed, and it, and it was developed in 1.9. It now works in 2 as well. But this is absolutely brilliant. Um, and as you can see, it can produce graphs for you. So you drop this in as a, uh, as a reporting module. An administrator would do that. And then there are all types of reports that you can select quite easily. Course reports, category reports. You can do timeline type reports. You can also write in there uh, standard SQL reports. Uh, so anything that you see on Tim Hunt's page with the with the ad hoc database queries can also go into here, and um, and and the wonderful thing is it's a it's a beautiful kind of um, drag and drop interface. So um, we have some uh, we find this so useful now um, that I've actually we've actually got a hidden course and we have lots and lots of reports which we've developed or copied or adapted and then we, we've done it in this format because we can then um, simply click on view to go and look at one of them or in fact edit. So, so this query here, show me all the users logged in in the last 120 days, I've also got an edit link because then I can instantly and quickly change that to show me who's logged in in the last seven days. Um, so, so that's um, you know, I highly recommend um, anyone that's that, that's looking at reporting in in Moodle um, to to certainly, if you're not into SQL, um, definitely definitely have a look at configurable reports. It's hugely powerful, um, and we're finding it a, the most indispensable item we've we've recently come across this year. You know, probably this year. This was the big find for us. It enabled us to do all sorts of reporting that really was a bit awkward before. So um, certainly for business users, you know, we often have quite demanding um, uh, managers above us who would like to see reports on this, that, and the other. Uh, and that's one of the ways that you can uh, potentially get there uh, without too much uh, heartache. Um, I'll mention themes briefly. Um, one of the things that always held Moodle back, I think, in the in the corporate and business sector, was that it didn't look so great um, out of the box, as we say, as soon as you installed it. Um, and I know because I've been in meetings and I've been involved with um, with uh, projects where uh, an other learning management system has walked in and given a presentation, which is basically nothing more than a flash front end to a very simple database. And managing directors have actually picked that as their learning management system of choice because they were so impressed with how great it looked and um, they actually weren't doing their job properly because they didn't look at what was actually behind the, the, behind the facade and what was actually going on and what was actually the educational value. They were just so impressed with how it looked. Um, I, I now feel that with Moodle 2, and, and 2.23 uh, and with the themes we've got, I think that battle is almost over. I think Moodle can look as good as you want to make it look now. Yes, it's technical. It requires some CSS skills and or, or you can ask someone to design a theme for you. 
but Moodle can look great, and, and that's the end of the story on that one now. It doesn't need to lose out to other systems because it doesn't look as good. Um, just want to mention a couple of useful plugins that we found for business users. And as I said, don't worry about trying to take all this, this in right now. Um, you can get to this course anytime. Um, these are the plugins that we found to be particularly useful for business users over, over the years. And um, something like the Lightbox Gallery. Um, so what we actually have here is we have a link to the plugin. We have a link to the documentation page. And we also have a demo. And that's the one I'm going to open. So I'm going to open this. And what this is going to do is take me to um, a site called dev.moodlebytes.com. And this is a public testing site that you can use. Um, it's, it's, um, it has now about 40 non-standard or 40 or 50 non-standard plugins. Um, we created this site because as a team, uh, we needed to be able to test these things and show clients these things. Um, and what we found, that although the plugins database on Moodle.org is really good now, it's so much better than it was, it still only gives you a description and maybe a link to the Git repository and perhaps a, a, a screenshot. Um, what this site gives you is actually the working thing. So, so you can come in here, and again, you can do this as a guest. We're not trying to get people to register on this site. Obviously, you get to try things out a little bit more if you've got a user account. Um, so I can just go into this Lightbox gallery, um, and as you see, I'm just using a, a guest account, um, and have a, a look at an example Lightbox gallery. Um, and what's cool about this is it's just a, a little add-in, and of course you can you get this lovely effect where you're able to, I'm not sure how fast those screens are catching me up, but basically you can click on those images and then... Uh, use that next, and, and it fades in uh, and out nicely. Now, I mean, you could have a product catalog or, or of your, you know, um, I don't know, what are you selling? Coffee pots and teapots. You could have some nice pictures like this on the front page of your Moodle site in a light box gallery um, with a nice PayPal form underneath so that per people can purchase that with a credit card online. Um, you know, Moodle is as flexible as you make it. Um, but one of the keys to making it flexible is to choose. Um, yep, the Lightbox Gallery plugin is uh, is available in the plugins area. Um, it's actually the 1.9 plugin that's available at the moment. But if you read the discussion, there's actually a post I think from Mark Greshler at Netspot, and there is a link where you can download the version that works with Moodle 2. Um, this site is running Moodle 2.2 right now, and obviously you can see it's 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 working fine. Um, so if you if you find um, uh, plugins that you think might be useful for business, you know you can certainly tell us, and we'll and we'll try and get it um, put in here. Even simple stuff like the contact form, you know, there's a little contact form uh, plugin, which basically creates an HTML block, and when you and it and there's a button, but when you click on that. It then gives you a nice little form, so you can say who you are, what your email address is, who you want to email, and that will list the teachers, the subject, and your query. So you can have a, a, a very simple, you know, customer contact form on on your Moodle site, and you're not having to do any coding. You're not having to think, oh, should we do this on our main website? You know, Moodle isn't good enough to do that sort of stuff. Um, but it is, um, and very often it's a case of looking for plugins, understanding what they do, and, um, and having a go. And as I said, there's lots of plugins that you can try here now um, that might be useful. So, so please feel free to, to rock in there and, um, and have a look at the various plugins that are available. Um, one thing I'll just mention, because I think this is quite cool, um, two things actually, quickly. The online audio recording uh, assignment. If you're dealing with, um, say, you're training people in, in language, this really solves a problem. Previously, it's been quite difficult to get audio uh, working in a slick way in Moodle. It's been possible, but it's always been a bit clunky. Um, whereas this allows you to record uh, an audio file while you're in your Moodle course. 
it converts it to MP3, it attaches it and it uploads it to Moodle and you don't need Java applets, you don't need streaming servers. Um, it does rely on Flash, which means of course that it won't work on an iPad. Uh, but it's, you know, it swings and roundabouts. So I think that's a very useful plugin right now that's going to get more and more popular. And the other thing I wanted to mention was Topbox. Um, we're always getting people asking us about how do we integrate with a with a, a, a video conferencing system, and quite often uh, Skype might be blocked within your organisation. Um, now there are there are solutions like Big Blue Button, which is fantastic. Uh, it's obviously a server application and uh, works best when you have uh, a second server to install that on. Um, I, we found Topbox, and, and we found that even with just um, a, a standard account that we could get uh, an embed code. I'm not going to click on this because I don't think it's a good idea to try and stream video through here, through Firefox, through Adobe Connect. Um, but you can obviously try it out yourselves later. Um, you can just click here and you'll get a, a two-way video conference or a, a four-way video conference, um, but embedded right there within your course. Uh, and that seems to us at the moment to be a really neat little solution. Like all these things, it might change in the future. They might want to charge. They might say there's a limit to four people, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but right now, if that's something that you think could be of interest uh, in a small organization on a small Moodle site, then definitely, definitely worth having a look at. Um, I think I'm going to finish there. Um, as I said, this, this is a, a huge course with lots of, lots of different ideas in and lots of things that, that I've picked up and that we find to be useful with business users. Um, you're absolutely quite welcome to have a look through here. There's a couple of little demonstrations of how you can use Dropbox and Evernote. I know quite a few people in business using Evernote and Dropbox. So how can we use those within our, our Moodle environment in a, in a smart way is, is um, worth a little bit of investigation. Um, yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing there just because I can then uh, maybe maybe can I just I know what I'm, I know what I'm going to do uh, I'm going to go to a different view I'm going to go to the end view <laughs> it's something I prepared earlier um, again we've just got a couple of little um, quizzes in there that you might uh, sorry polls that you might just want to uh, again indicate it, I guess it's useful for me to um, to see that. Okay, well, I just tried to connect my camera and the whole thing died, so I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> um, I'm quite happy to uh, answer questions. If you've got uh, questions that you want to just post in the chat now, that's um, cool. Um, if you want to obviously think about that or, or maybe uh, watch it, uh, even watch the other presentation, which didn't have so many dropouts. It didn't have any. It was actually great. Um, or post ideas in the in the forum, in the course area, or just contact me through um, the, the, the free Moodle site or the, or the business site. And messages to help desk that are for me will, will eventually get to me. Um, um, cool, Yvonne. Yeah, if that gives you lots of new ideas, that's, that's um, absolutely what we're trying to do. Thanks, Vasilis. Um, uh, thanks, Liz. Hopefully, um, you know, there's, there's a limit to what you can do um, in an hour with, with such a diverse subject, uh, Moodle in business. I mean, it's as huge as Moodle itself. But, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, um, gonna to finish off there. Hopefully, that's been useful. You can get to this later to review it. And as I mentioned a number of times, those a lot of those courses are free and, and guest access, and you can just wander in there and and um, take take whatever is is useful uh, and use it. And um, you know, feedback ideas that's cool. I have to do this presentation um, at least three times this year in 
Australia and Oklahoma as a workshop. No, not Oklahoma, Indiana and Los Angeles and um, possibly even Crete, who knows? So, um, yeah. Um, okay, Baz, interesting question. Um, Totara and Ellis. Um, Ellis, I think, is great because um, it builds upon Moodle and, it, and there's an open source version and um, it's been around for a long time. Totara, I completely disagree with. I think it's um, one organization trying to take a sector of the market and just basically do what we do in business most of the time, which is to think more about our own advantage rather than the community's advantage. Um, I noticed recently that um, Dan Marsden saying that um, Catalyst were going we're gonna to continue security updates for Moodle 1.9 until the end of the year, which is brilliant. Uh, but of course they have to do that because Totara is 1.9 at this stage. It hasn't been updated for two as far as I'm aware. Um, I just think that we should all be putting more effort into Moodle itself. And um, if people want to build enhancements and sideways plugins and um, uh, other things that can interface, that's great. And that's what Moodle does. It has APIs that are open and it tries to allow people to interface. I don't think it serves the greater purpose for us to try and um, sub-develop or, or create sub-products. It's just not my, uh, my, it's not my perception of the best way to go. So, um, having said that, we get on really well with Catalyst. You know, we're, we're based in New Zealand with Catalyst. We know all the guys there. Highest opinion of people like Piers and Dan and the work they do. You know, um, it's just one of those business decisions that. Works for them, doesn't work for me. <laughs> okay, I think um, Shane is, are you going to wrap that up there, Shane, officially? Uh, okay, it's actually Don today. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, Don, how are you, mate? Good, good, very good, thank you. Um, thanks uh, for that excellent presentation. You know, we've all got a lot out of it. I know I'll be picking it to bits soon. Um, yeah, just thank you very much, and um, we'll close the session for now. We'll stop the recording, but should people want to hang around, um, they're more than welcome to. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Okay, bye-bye.